organized by the Department of History, the IQSC of Vinasanto College Pishra, uh, which is situated in Upi, West Bengal, uh, India. Uh, we are affiliated at the University of uh, Calcutta. Uh, so, uh, welcome to today's webinar on the history of India's foreign relations through normal times. Uh, its history has India lost uh, her foreign policy. So today uh, we have got as our distinguished uh, guests, uh, we have got uh, uh, Dr. Sudip Roy, uh, he is the MLA uh, uh, of Sirampur constituency and he is also the president of the governing body uh, of Vidhan uh, Chandra College, uh, Rishwa. Uh, then we have got our vice principal, Dr. Ramesh Paul. Uh, we have got as keynote speaker, Professor Sivashish uh, uh, Chatterjee. He is the Professor of the uh, Department of International Relations, Jadavpur uh, University, West Bengal. Uh, we have Professor Pradhan, uh, he uh, is the Associate Professor of the He is the Associate Professor of the Department of International Relations, uh, University of Chittagong, uh, Bangladesh. So, uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Siripta Roy, uh, uh, sir, he is uh, unable to attend uh, to this program due to some uh, DC school uh, office. So we will start with uh, our Vice Principal, uh, Dr. Ramesh Kaur. Uh, I will request uh, Sir to formally welcome you all. Uh, so uh, we will give the welcome address. So now, uh, Sir, it's uh, over to you. You can uh, deliver your uh, welcome address. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Respected President of the Governing Body, Respected Distinguished Research Person, Honorable Dignitaries, Dear Colleague, Research Scholar, Beloved Convener, Joint Convener, Program Advisor, Coordinator, Joint Coordinator, and Excellent Student. It is a real pleasure and privilege to be present with the International Webinar organized by the Department of history in collaboration with IQAC. Being the head of the institute, I must congratulate the teachers of the Department of History, especially Dr. Swamin Raman Bishas, who has taken the initiative to organize the international webinar. First of all, I on behalf of the institute must welcome the respective research person Professor Shivasis Chatterjee, Department of International Relations, Jadavpur University. Dr. Rudraprasad Pradhan, Associate, Associate Professor, Department of Social Science, Builder Institute of Technology and Science, Pilani Goa. Professor Sarah Hilal, Hilali, Department of Rajiv Gandhi University, Arunachal Pradesh. Professor Dilwar Hoshan, Department of International Relations, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh. Dr. Suji Dokto, Associate Professor, Department of International Relations, University of Chittagong, Bangladesh. I would be immensely grateful as they have responded to our invitation despite their busy schedule. I convey my best wishes to our governing body members for moral support to organize the international webinar. I do hope that our participants would reap a sound harvest from the day's discussion. I, I firmly believe that the day's discussion will be interesting and interactive one. The survey of the day's speech and reciprocal discussion, I do hope would further illumine the minds of the teachers and taught. I wish a warm success of the days I have now. Once again, thanking you all. Namaskar. We will move on to the, uh, uh, move on to our keynote speaker. Uh, I will uh, request uh, Professor uh, Sribashish uh, Chatterjee. Is the Professor of Department of International Relations, Jadavpur University, to deliver the keynote address of today's uh, program. Uh, so, sir, uh, can you, sir, can you hear me? Hello. Uh, 
Shubhashi sir, can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear yeah. you absolutely fine. Yeah, yeah sir. Uh, so uh, now uh, you can deliver your keynote address. So it's uh, over to you now. Thank you very much. Uh, I take this opportunity to extend my uh, you know, warm thanks to the Department of History of uh, of, of this institution who in fact have you know uh, had this seminar in mind the webinar rather in mind and you know invited me to deliver uh, the keynote address let me at the outset say that look you know i'm not really sort of delivering a very formal you know keynote address which uh, uh, in fact requires a lot of time and i don't wish to extend this uh, to uh, any uh, anything more than 15 to 20 minutes i've already promised let's say and I'm also not uh, going to either, in a way, let's say, you know, empirically narrate uh, the concatenation of Indian foreign policy over the long period, starting uh, historically, let's say, you know, from uh, the Nehruvian times to the present era. Nor am I, in a sense, let's say, highlighting what really are very major, you know, tasks and issues which bedevil uh, our foreign policy right at the outset. So what I have in, instead, uh, you know, uh, decided to do is very broadly speak on uh, five sets of issues, which in fact would possibly cover 15 to 20 minutes of time that I claim for myself. My first uh, argument that I make, in fact, is that, uh, that the fundamental element uh, in Indian foreign policy uh, is the quest for recognition. And this quest for recognition, in fact, is the central narrative, which in fact is far more critical and, and important than the other two, uh, I would say, objectives that are often uh, touted as essential, uh, being uh, security on one hand and economic well-being on the other. So my first argument, in fact, is that both security and, and economic well-being, these are largely sort of predicated on India's claim to recognition, which in fact is the historical I would say, you know, an existential precondition, let's say, of India's foreign policy. Now, what is significant and critical is that this notion of recognition, in fact, had gradually evolved in Indian foreign policy. And my first point, in fact, is to share uh, what exactly is the nature of this evolution that we have. In a nutshell, uh, even the fact that, you know, we have paucity of time and I'm not going to extend this, what we have seen over the years is a gradual, let's say, transition from a form of recognition which could be described as politics of universalism to another form of recognition which is largely in the nature of politics of difference. Now, what this basically sort of amounts to is this, that if you look at the notion of recognition closely, whether you are looking at the individual, I would say, driver of recognition or a more collective driver of recognition, which happens to be the case here, because we're looking at uh, India as a nation state. But while the, uh, the nature of the actor, in fact, is different, but the conceptual, you know, I would say, brass tacks of recognition, in fact, doesn't change if you shift the levels of analysis. In simple terms, what I wish to say is this, that whether you are looking at an individual as a basis of recognition, or you are looking at a state as a basis of recognition, the conceptual moorings, in fact, will not change. They, in fact, you know, would largely remain the same. So with this in mind, what I intend to tell you is this, that the earlier notion of recognition, in fact, was a modern notion of recognition where there was a gradual distinction, let's say, from a notion of recognition based on honor, which in fact is much more hierarchical in nature, which makes a distinction, let's say, between the, uh, the, the honor, you know, claiming agent on the one hand and the honor recognizing agents on the other. We, in fact, have gradually moved into a more modern notion, let's say, of recognition, which was based on equal respect on one hand and a form of uh, autonomy, you know, as self-realization on the other. So, in a sense, this shift, in fact, is largely, you know, was a shift from the more Hegelian, you know, to a more Kantian idea, let's say, recognition. And one finds this amply demonstrated in the way in which Nehru, in fact, had, you know, uh, thought about India's role in world affairs, which was not only based on recognition, but was also largely based on a progressive notion where the idea, in fact, was 
that you know the vision that India in fact would have of the world would be larger than India itself. Okay, so it would be a progressive you know notion, which in fact would not be narrowly limited to the parochial claims of India's you know uh, I would say you know national interests. But that very notion of the national interest, in fact, would be a far more enlightened and progressive national interest, which in fact would be in line with the progressive, you know, you know, I would say, imagination of the world. Now, over the years, what we have witnessed, in fact, is that gradually, from this autonomy-centric idea, let's say, of recognition, Indian foreign policy had gradually sort of shifted and keeps shifting towards what would be called, again, a kind of rever you know, revering back to more on a centric notion, let's say, of recognition, where India seems to be more and more conscious of its power claims. And while uh, the power claim, in fact, is uh, a, a reflex of, uh, by and large, let's say, you know, the materiality of India, uh, but then it's also, in a sense, uh, a reflection of the fact that it's uh, a move towards a more hierarchical, let's say, sort of notion, where uh, there is a recognition of a hierarchy, which means that there is a recognition of differences in terms of power. But there is a claim that India, in fact, must be recognized its legitimate place in the pantheon of nations, you know, which means that it's an endorsement of the hierarchy. But at the same time, it's also a claim that India occupies a position which is high up on the hierarchy. Now, the second uh, argument that I put forward you know, to you is that if you are a if you are studying Indian foreign policy, then it's very clear to us that Indian foreign policy, in fact, happens in two, I would say, simultaneous but inextricably intertwined registers. One of the registers of Indian foreign policy, in fact, is power, which is very well known, and the other, in fact, is normativity or norms. And I would end up talking, uh, you know, a bit more on norms and possibly would not really have much time you know, to talk on power, and I hope that the others, in fact, you know, basically sort of ten papers would touch upon the elements of power more closely. So coming to norms, the argument that I put forward is this, that look, in a sense, to understand Indian foreign policy, in fact, is to come to terms of the foreign policy identity that India, in fact, had posited, and India, in fact, had articulated over a period of time. How do we make sense of this foreign policy identity? Now, uh, very largely, there are three, I would say, you know, uh, possible explanations of this foreign policy identity that you find in the literature that exists. Amongst many, and again, given the time constraint that we have, that I'm not going to take you through all the, you know, possible, let's say, sort of imaginations that we, uh, you know, <laughs> that we come by. But these three, in fact, are so critically important and they're conceptually so very rich that it really begs some, some, you know, some of our time and attention in order to come to terms with them. So the first notion of identity that we have, in fact, is the notion of victim, which is basically a kind of an identity which Manjuri Miller, you know, based, you know, articulates in the form of an idea which says that, look, India and also a country like China, they, in fact, have always thought of themselves as victims of colonialism. And that scar of colonialism, in fact, had somehow remained in their you know, post-colonial side. So therefore, even if you are looking at post-colonial foreign policy, the distinction between the colonial and the post-colonial, in fact, is something which is very difficult really to completely, completely overcome, you know, in cases of countries like India on one hand and China on the other. One aspect of this uh, you know, notion of victimhood, in fact, is tremendous sensitivity to claims of sovereignty and territorial nationalism. In the simplest of terms, it, ba it basically means that these countries, in fact, they show extraordinary sensitivity to claims of territoriality and claims of sovereignty. And any possible move, I repeat, any possible move, in fact, which seems to be a dilution of these notions of territoriality and sovereignty, in fact, would be resisted and would be critiqued by powers like India and powers like China. So if you're looking closely to India, this in fact is a one possible foreign policy identity, which in fact is there. The second foreign policy identity that one comes across, in fact, is found in uh, writings of scholars like Estrada Sullivan and others, who broadly says that look, the 
principal idea of Indian foreign policy, in fact, you know, is in the concept of its civilizational heritage. Now, civilizational heritage, in fact, is such an interesting concept, and it has many, again, sort of, you know, interesting permutations and combinations, many variations on the theme. One of the critical, you know, I would say, element here, in fact, is, as I, as I said, is what Sullivan says, you know, who, you know whose, whose point is that, look, there are these two aspects to India's, you know, claim to identity. One, it's claim that it has always been a power which is different from others, and its notion of difference comes and its notion of difference comes from what its notion of difference comes from. It's from what is called, you know, uh, peaceful coexistence, which separates from powers in the past, who in fact had not really been good of others. But India, in fact, is committed to the and it's committed to the idea of peaceful coexistence. The second aspect, you know, which uh, is, you know, which Sullivan talks about is that India's claim civilization and civilizational heritage also you know builds on its pluralism you know its its capacity to live in a diverse society its capacity for dialogue its capacity for negotiation its capacity in fact you know uh, in, in a sense to, to balance claims of difference of one hand and claims of gener and generality on the other something in fact which again you know makes India so very different from great many other you know, I would say nations of the world. I mean, the claim is not that India, in fact, is the sole civilizational you know, state. That's not the claim. But the claim is that there is distinctiveness in this claim. And this distinctiveness, in fact, is the legacy of uh, not only having a great civilization of the past, but also by virtue of the fact that our civilization, in fact, have been, uh, you know, committed to peaceful coexistence and been in largely a different society. Um, Able to sort of negotiate differences between uh, Cohen, in fact, you know, has a slightly different notion, let's say, of his civilization heritage uh, in his own writings, where he has largely sort of made the argument that India's claim to civilization is much more historical, you know, uh, which sort of builds on the past of one hand and the Muslim heritage, which till very recent times, in fact, have been an inextricable part of our national history. And so therefore, when, you know, whether you were looking at Ashoka, or you were looking at a or you were looking at Akbar, all these in fact have conquered, all these things in fact have conquered this great civilization heritage. And accordingly, in fact, you know, India can be claim uh, to a voice and to a role. There's very few states in fact Finally, the third idea of identity which we have for policy is also quite right? so it is, it is important. It's a new identity. Which is basically sort of based on, you know, uh, cultural nationalism. Now, cultural nationalism is a uh, controversial idea. Now, I'm not going to you know, you know, the details of this imagination right now. But this is an imagination which thrives on difference, broadly sort of makes the claim that unless India, in fact, is able to culturally salvage itself, and the salvaging aspect of its culture, in fact, would have to be, in a way, mired in a Hindu imagination of its cultural ethos, it would never be able to realize the potential to power, which in fact predicates on its exclusive cultural heritage. In other words, in the simplest of terms, the argument here is this, that we need to, you know, discipline ourselves in a manner so that the diversity, in fact, doesn't really become a source of weakness, which the argument goes, in fact, had been in the past. So we need to be robust, we need to be, you know, sanitized enough. And the sanitized, robust form, in fact, can only come from a certain commitment to a strong form of cultural nationalism, in fact, which would, in a way, you know, invest in, uh, in, in a form of power, which India, in fact, had not had in the past. The third point, which I uh, wish to sort of share, you know, in, in, in front of you, is the fact that, look, a great amount of continuity to Indian foreign policy, in fact, can be read in what is known as the concept of uh, what would be called positive autonomy. So what is this positive autonomy that one is talking about? This positive, positive autonomy, in fact, uh, historically we call a certain principle non-alignment or it would be called a kind of nexus strategic autonomy, which in fact have been touted you know, in more recent terms. But all, what all these in fact amount to is a kind of a shift, let's say, in Indian foreign policy, you know, from one kind of freedom uh, which was based more on uh, a negative understanding of freedom 
to a more positive understanding of freedom through the ETs of foreign policy. I'll very briefly tell you what exactly that is. So if you look closely to the Cold War understanding of foreign policy that we have, or the more, uh, I would say, paradigmatic Nehruvian understanding of foreign policy that we in fact have, and which we continue for a very long period of time, and in many ways, till our, you know, nuggets of foreign policy, in fact, you know, would largely be, you know, in, 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 in many ways, let's say, Nehruvian. So, if you look closely, the Cold War understanding of that imagination was that India needed to maintain a principal distance, let's say, you know, from the two poles of power. So, the measure of autonomy, in fact, the value of autonomy, the measure of our distance, let's say, from these two distinctive poles of power. Now, in the post-Cold War, in the fact that the two have one pole of power, okay, and I'm not really going into the right of China, but I'm not really going into the right of China. Uh, the argument, in fact, goes that it makes very little sense to make the argument that you can really have you know, a kind of a measure, let's say, distance from a pole of power, which is the sole pole of power. And the, uh, the, the criticality of the argument is that the measurement of freedom, in fact, doesn't actually lie in the distance that you have. Rather, you need to have a calibration of freedom by closely looking at whether you were able to realize your claims of autonomy to purposive meaningful foreign policy action or not. So if realization demands proximity to power, then that associational proximity in fact is what you need to do. So that doesn't detract from freedom, that actually adds to it, that actually best, that makes it freer. So that's basically a positive idea of, uh, of, of freedom, which is a sense of positive autonomy, which in fact is new. In fact, it is a departure from the more negative orientation that India's foreign policy in fact have had in the past. The fourth point which I place before you, in fact, is that one of the major, you know, uh, consistent pillars of Indian foreign policy, in fact, had been a certain idea or a certain notion of multilateralism that, in fact, had always been there in Indian foreign policy. This broadly means what? This broadly means that India, in fact, had always been conscious, let's say, of its uh, of its responsibilities beyond its shores, okay, which means that, you know, India had always embraced the notion of national interest, which is not parochial, which is not limited only to claims of power that you could, you know, reach only to the geographical, territorial ambit of India. But in a sense, it's a, it's a balance, let's say, between our, uh, you know, claims of, uh, you know, national, you know, interest on one hand, and the more... Uh, you know, I would say a, a more universalistic cosmopol cosmopolitan attachments, you know, on the other. So it's a balance between, in the simplest of terms, nationalism on one hand and cosmopolitanism on the other. So if you were looking at India's multilateralism, there are two aspects to India's multilateralism and it's very difficult to generalize them. One aspect to India's multilateralism, historically in fact, is that it's a form of multilateralism which in fact is best described as a form of non-domination, as a, a, you know, as a date to justice, which basically means what? Which basically means that India in fact had been extremely cautious of the claim that nations in fact must be protected against all kinds of, you know, uh, arbitrary interferences and, you know, great power, you know, what would be called great, great power interferences, let's say, which in fact makes what? Which makes, uh, you know, uh, Realizing a, a, a nation's foreign policy objectives is very, very difficult. So non-domination basically means that every state, in fact, has a scripted, you know, what we call potential. And non-domination here simply means that it is by uh, balancing your dreams, or, you know, of, of national interest with your cosmopolitan responsibilities that you were able to realize that scripted, you know, what you call potential that you have. And you need multilateral institutions so that you were able to do that. The second aspect of multilateralism, in fact, is this, that India's multilateralism is also a commitment to justice, which is sensitive to the claims of difference. Why this is important is because that if you look at the architecture of, of the world order that we run, regardless of the kind of you know, uh, crisis that we, in fact, are encountering, and my argument, in fact, is that if we look closely, that we are still very much in the throes of, or in the cusp of, the inherited international order that we are running despite the crisis that we are currently facing. So if you look closely to that inherited, uh, you know, international order which we run, it's by and large a Western order. 
it's by and large an order which in fact you know, uh, you know, you know which, which, is, which is based on commitments to certain Western principles. India's you know, position you know, had always been that on the one hand she remains committed to you know, largely to a set of you know, ideas which could be you know, in a sense argued as or described as you know, uh, liberal you know, I would say ideas but on the other hand India is exclusively I would say sensitive very, very sensitive to its claim of difference, broadly making the argument that countries which are made civilizational states like India, in fact, they will always have problems in uh, finding, you know, what would be called proper roles or fitting roles, you know, within this Western architecture. And where there is a kind of clash between the, uh, the aspirational roles of India one on one hand, and the kind of tasks that India, in fact, would have to implement through the existing institutions of uh, the international order on the other. The only guarantee that India seeks, in fact, is the guarantee of difference. In other words, there must be significant space within the multilateral order where the specificity of India and states like India, in fact, which can only be expressed through the language of difference, in fact, you know, uh, is properly and legitimately active. And absolutely, finally, my final argument, in fact, is that, you know, India, in fact, has gradually, you know, moved from being what I call a non-conformist to an increasingly conformist, you know, major power. Now, what is essentially meant by this is that, look, you know, you have to emphasize and you have to understand both the materiality of power on one hand and the normative prerequisites of uh, a responsible power. Okay on the other, you know, which means that the materiality of power is very well understood and there has not been a major revolution there, you know, in the sense that India has sort of largely remained committed to uh, the uh, conventional, let's say, you know, models of political economy and largely remained committed to democracy. But on the other hand, if you look closely, where the shift in fact, you know, has taken place is that India in fact has become far more, I would say, accepting of the many responsibilities that the world order in fact trusts upon them as India's material power in fact has grown. So in the past, India's claim to greatness, India's foreign policy voice in fact was more of a voice, let's say, of a power which wasn't really a materially, you know, I would say significant state, but it was making all kinds of claims on the basis of its moral notions of difference. But now, increasingly, in fact, what you have is this more, you know, I would say, uh, well-calibrated balance between materiality on one hand which sort of is predicated on India's economic growth uh, largely and India's increasing military prowess. And on the other hand, the moral responsibilities or the normative responsibilities, you know, or, you know, that the new international order, in fact, poses on a state like India on the other. So therefore you find what, so therefore you find that India exercises those responsibilities to self-restraint, okay? I mean, so again, the argument is that India, in fact, is a major power, it's a rising power, but, you know, we could not be a rising power which, in fact, would uh, take others to task. We would not be a new colonial power, okay? So, it would be a trusting power. It would be, in fact, in many ways, a power which would be innately democratic in nature. But the fact is what? But the fact is that, you know, on the other hand, it would also be a case, you know, where you would find what? It's also be a case where you will find that India is committed to our uh, you know, the like power for example, the provision of Kalim 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 is far more accepting, and this is where the conformist part comes in, far more accepting rather than revolting of the existing norms, let's say, of the global order, you know, and whether these norms in fact are part of the, you know, uh, the, the, the last, the, let's say, you know, a liberal political economy, whether these part into emphasizing the democratic nature of the world system, or they part into a problematic aspect, you know, which had been in the past in Indian foreign policy, like proliferation of goals and proliferation of goals. But in all these major issues, that there is a shift, you know, that the India that we used to have in the past, which in fact was an India,
this in fact was much more of a, I would say, so on alias kind of a power. You know, always trying to, in a sense, you know, uh, uh, try, trying to, trying to, let's say, you know, make a claim for an alternative world order. Uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 a world order, in fact, which would be predicated on, 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 on an alternative value to a power which is much more acceptable than order. And therefore, much more in comfort, let's say, you know, with the uh, with with the the architecture, whether you understand that architecture in terms of the more regular distribution of power or in terms of the institutional dynamic that you have. This so is the script through which I read this And this is a script which is as much uh, a description of continuity as much of Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for this uh, wonderful uh, address. Uh, uh, sir, uh, once again, thank you for this. Uh, if uh, the participants have any questions uh, regarding this, we will come back uh, in the end. Uh, so next, uh, we'll move on to the uh, next uh, session of ours, uh, where we'll have the panel uh, discussion, and uh, that discussion will be chaired by uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, this is the uh, Pradhan uh, and he and will be also there as a speaker. So, uh, and in that panel discussion, we will have Professor Sara Hilali. Uh, she is the Professor of Department of History, uh, Rajiv Gandhi University, uh, Rono Il uh, Boimu, Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, then we will have Professor Dilwar Hussain. Uh, he is the Professor of Department of International Relations, uh, University of Dhaka. Bangladesh and we will have another distinguished speaker from Bangladesh, uh, Dr. Sujit Dotto, he is the Associate Professor of Department of International Relations, University of Chittagong, uh, Bangladesh. So now uh, I will request uh, Dr. Rudra Prasad Pradhan to now I will hand over the virtual microphone to you and uh, you can start this uh, panel. This. Uh, thank you everybody. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, you are audible, sir. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you, everybody. It is a wonderful uh, beginning, I think, uh, the keynote speaker. A number of questions, of course, I have to you, sir. Um, uh, but at the end of it, we will uh, talk about it. Uh, now, uh, I'm connecting from Goa, from Bits Milani, Goa campus. And the mandate for me is to uh, chair the session and uh, capture also the history of India's foreign relations in new normal. And there is also a kind of a, you know, a statement, a statement that uh, has India lost our foreign policy. So these are all two uh, separate uh, you know, themes uh, together. So I'm trying to capture both of them and uh, you know, present my views. Then I'll invite my fellow you know, panelists also to speak on their uh, areas of uh, you know, thought. Now, uh, from the normative uh, proposition that uh, Dr. Chatterjee talked about, I'm moving to the experimental, the world reality you know, aspect of how the foreign policy has been executed from the Indian side itself and how have we looked at the world ourselves and how has the world looked at us from their perspective also. And I'm trying to create a synergy between what has happened at the experimental level, at the ground level. Now, when we talk of uh, you know, foreign policy, today in particularly world order, and all of us, we are uh, familiar that we are in a great uh, transition time and uh, the transition can be captured in two ways. One, that's uh, Graham Allison's Thucydides trap that proposes that uh, the rise of a new power in the town would invariably you know, encourage a situation where the old powers will resist and there is a physical fight and war that we are uh, facing today. And well, India can well be one of the front of Thucydides trap. The second aspect, uh, I would say, Gramalism was a realist, is a realist. But convergence is interpreted in multiple ways. And Amita Bacharya, he talks about a phenomena called multiplex world order. Kisar Mebubani, uh, the Singapore uh, diplomat of uh, Lee Kuan Yi Institute of Public Policy, he wrote the first book uh, called The Great Convergence, where he says that world is witnessing far less number of wars, quality of life has improved, People are converging more into many, many things. But the economists and the sociologists, they have uh, different uh, interpretation of the convergence that we see uh, today. Uh, 
Richard Baldwin. Richard Baldwin is currently teaching at uh, Geneva School of Economics and he wrote his book in 2016 called The Great Convergence. He looks at the, the convergence idea from the economic point of view where he says that from 1990s the world order critically, critically moved from what you call the manufacturing economy to the idea economy or the knowledge economy and what the knowledge economy did is that that uh, the manufacturing economy particularly he mentions was a time frame of uh, great divergence that few countries in the world had the technology of manufacturing and so they became uh, super rich rest of the world remained poor and that's where he called the phenomena uh, of uh, great divergence because it created polarity of wealth and rest of the world remained uh, you know less uh, rich 90s onwards or early 80s onwards what has happened is that uh, you know the capital uh, uh, the north american capital and the european capital is meeting the chinese labor indonesian labor and indian, indian labor or, or philippines labor or mexican labor and they are creating productivity and what has what it has created is a very serious critical uh, change in the in the world order that's it uh, de-industrialized North America and Europe. It critically industrialized China that we see today is the industrial depth of China. That is what is creating the Thucydides strap uh, phenomena. It is happening because of the, the dynamic change of mode of production, Marxian mode of, mode of production that changed. That's what has shifted the world order. And suddenly many countries in the world, they became, like, became economically poor at the cost of the Americans, at the cost of the Europeans and all that. And we are more and more moving towards a, towards a you know, multipolarity framework and I think uh, Professor Chatterjee also uh, captured it very well. So we stand at this moment as we are talking, we stand at this uh, uh, great uh, you know, uh, crossroads of Thucydides trap and great convergence. Now where does India's foreign policy negotiate itself you know, historically and uh, till now or how are we looking forward? the future times as we are uh, debating on this. I would uh, like to capture it since it is uh, history of India's foreign policy till uh, your normal. I would capture the India's foreign policy till today in six phases. One is that uh, I'm trying to capture both the sociologists, the economists, the political scientists and you know, all of them together to look at a world order and its transition that is happening and where is India positioning itself in the whole whole uh, narrative from the beginning till today. So I divide the, the, the class, uh, they categorize the whole spectrum into six phases. First, if we look at it, you know, from the day one or millennium one till 1820s. And I think all of us, we are familiar today, uh, unjust Madison's uh, great amount of data is available today. And uh, uh, 1820s, till 1820s, India and China, there were the agrarian economy, world mode of production was uh, uh, you know uh, agriculture and as long as the mode of production of the world was agriculture india and china being the largest uh, you know countries uh, along the river basins that rose from tibet they became the civilizational core and they had the highest number of population and they had the large number of peasants farmers they cultivated more, so they produced more. India at one point was producing 33% of world's GDP and China and India put together close to 60% of world economy, world GDP, they produced two countries and they produced uh, nearly 60% of world economy. These two countries alone. 1820s, you know, this is all medicines, uh, uh, unjust medicines uh, data are clearly you know, available these days, so one can look at it. 1820s onwards, British colonial uh, you know, imposition you know, intensifies in India and that's where the new uh, you know, uh, beginning happens. So as long as the world economy was agrarian, India and China they were the forefront of productivity, how were we conducting our foreign policy? We were trading to with, uh, East Africa, West Asia, Southeast Asia up to China and all that. Also we were going up to North Africa and Italy and Europe spice trade to many of these things if we look at it we had a great uh, you know trade uh, driven connectivity with most of these countries and the trade only carried prosperity it didn't carry war chola dynasty in south if you look at it both the navy wise and the political influence wise they had critical influence in southeast asia and, and, and so on 
And if we look at, uh, you know, mostly Indian historians have missed out uh, this part of it. When Vasco da Gama came to India, you know, in fact, he came to uh, to Kenya and to Gujarati, you know, uh, shipping, uh, you know, pilots, they were trading in that area. They were familiar with the, with the waters and all that. They piloted Vasco da Gama's vessels to Calicut. History has not recorded the Gujarati pilots, those who piloted Vasco da Gama, but history, world history records, because uh, mostly it is written by the Westerns and we are consuming it still. And Vasco da Gama is claimed to be the discoverer of uh, sea route to India and all that. So how was the whole uh, atmosphere? I think Professor Chatterjee put it as a uh, cosmopolitanian uh, approach. I would uh, join with him in saying that India had a great cosmopolitan orientation uh, till, till this time. Then comes the second phase of it, and uh, that's from 1820s onwards. British arrival, it created uh, you know, both a territorial consciousness, created the state as a phenomena of territory, and also it had both uh, you know, it uh, influenced uh, poverty, you know, huge taxation, and, uh, you know, and then cultural and intellectual manipulation of the India civilizational value order and all that, and that's what I think uh, if we look at it, you know, it has been a distortion of India's uh, orientation value system or what has been projected of India, you know, international system, it's largely through the British, British narratives and all that. But in spite of that, continuing with the cosmopolitan character of the civilizational value order of India, if we look at it, both the First World War and Second World War, India participated, more than 2 million Indian soldiers participated in both the wars in great parts of the world and food grains, millions of tons of food grains also were supported to the war uh, uh, no, initiative of the British and we thought that the British will be kind and they will uh, grant India independence. So, but that's what didn't happen, India finally, you know. So that's the second phase where British uh, impact on India and its orientation, that's the second phase. I come to third phase that begins with uh, 1947 onwards. And 1947 onwards when we look at it, how was the whole world order? So that uh, is divided into bipolarity, uh, roughly about 100 countries in the world. But today, if you look at it, we have 193 countries. That means more than 90 countries have been added to the political geography of the, of the world. And that's where India is trying to negotiate itself in the emergence of new states and all of that. And uh, Nehru begins his, uh, you know, Nehruvian model, I think, is a very popular uh, model. But more than Nehru's uh, foreign policy you know, uh, to China or many other countries or uh, even uh, Bandung Conference and all of that, I would appreciate the non-aligned approach that Nehru initiated. So there was a fundamental uh, you know, you know, character of India that he continued. And if I remember correctly that uh, Nehru in 1925, he was uh, holidaying in Switzerland and uh, 1925, he was holidaying in Switzerland and uh, witness the Swiss uh, neutrality of the from the European countries, and that's where ignited his imagination that if at all India can remain remain neutral, and and I think uh, it was a great uh, statesmanship on his part to lead the country in, uh, into a theme of equidistance from both the poles of the world, and we became a non-aligned leader that subsequently also also converges into what we call the South-South cooperation and many other uh, orders of that. What we followed in terms of economy, uh, we followed the ISI model, import substitution and industrialization, and we also followed, followed Arthur Lewis' uh, dual sector model, where we emphasized on agriculture, and we also emphasized on building on the modern industry, steel plants and all of that that we, we talked about. Now, that's the third phase. Now, fourth phase, if I, if I come to, uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi's uh, foreign policy, phenomena. I keep it as a separate uh, you know, uh, chapter itself for uh, three reasons. One is that Bangladesh uh, campaign. I think uh, Professor Cherezi also talked about strategic auto autonomy. And uh, in the context of uh, maintaining India or uh, remaining away from the, from the bipolarity, India had a you know, non-aligned uh, approach and all that. But it has always remained civilizationally you know, uh, value added and cosmopolitan in character and Bangladesh of course uh, has immediate impact on India's uh, political system processes and sociology itself. So Mrs. Gandhi decisively participated in the Bangladesh campaign 
and uh, if i remember correctly an of uh, nixon government uh, that time was coordinating with china to create uh, the opening for china to join the uh, united nations and uh, henry kissinger he arrived in delhi in one of his secret missions uh, on his way to beijing and he wanted to have a word with uh, mrs gandhi and we were just away uh, not days away from bangladesh war and uh, mrs gandhi was to have breakfast with uh, henry kissinger henry kissinger uh, the previous evening uh, she telephoned personally to sam manexa saying that join me for breakfast with full military uniform and the military man uh, and uh, she said also okay, this is an order so manexa as a soldier uh, came next day morning for breakfast but wondering that uh, man is calling me for breakfast prime minister is calling me for breakfast but with full military uniform what is the what's the the uh, issue about and uh, on the breakfast table sam manexa realized that the third man in the breakfast table was henry kissinger and he had precisely come to persuade mrs gandhi not to intervene in bangladesh and one narrative in that goes mrs gandhi the person who was serving the breakfast the waiter mrs gandhi asked him in hindi saying ki kitna der isko jalna padega you know in a sense mrs gandhi had decided that we will maintain this strategic autonomy come whatever we are intervening that's where i think i think uh, not only india has been cosmopolitan in character value guided by the civilizational order and and so on but it has also always had the core intention and desire to maintain its strategic autonomy and independence in the foreign policy approaches and all that that's where bangladesh is a prominent uh, you know strategic autonomy phase for india then the nuclearization program of india and the south south cooperation these are all you know uh, teams all of them are uh, characterizing the whole this is on this uh, separate chapter uh, of india's foreign policy and its handling fifth phase 1991 onwards 1991 onwards uh, if we look at it you now we are incrementally we opened up to world economy economic globalization and, and uh, so on and we had you know uh, largely uh, now we also had a nuclear test also second uh, 1998 uh, nuclear test and economic liberalization and then a lot of scientific development through 80s and 90s also has happened like institutions like isro that we are achieving uh, milestones in the space research it is part of this uh, this phase of the the narrative itself but it is largely what happened that's also the time when we are getting into more and more pakistan driven uh, what you call the terrorism uh, proxy war phenomena and all that and how india as a foreign policy mechanism instrument responded to that is in the form of what i would largely call it as a defensive offense that we wanted to just uh, you know preserve ourselves not being very aggressive we just responded to the to the whole phenomena that's what is fifth phase of uh, sixth phase the final phase that we come is that now how where are we standing or how are we conducting ourselves in terms of the foreign policy if we look at that now clearly we have moved uh, we continue to have the strategic autonomy as an idea as a normative uh, proposition we also have moved out uh, from the limitations of defensive offense to offensive defense ajit doval keeps talking about it clearly people are no more feeling sigh about it uh, prime minister modi also talked about that india does have nuclear weapons not for diwali purpose but also not for diwali purpose he remains silent there but that means a clear intent that if at all it comes to that we will apply we may also be forced to apply that also we have uh, no more uh, limitations of no first use i know nobody has talked about clearly but i think we are uh, we are uh, by intent we are also you know uh, trying to imagine that in the maritime sector particularly in the indo pacific uh, front what we are trying to do is that we are part of the international uh, you know strategic coalition uh, quad quad plus iora uh, indian ocean dream association and number of that means we are in a comfortable zone of uh, international coalition that will possibly safeguard india's national interest and, and so on in the economic space how are we doing it today is that we are uh, you know with uh, g77 that's what i would call it as the as the global uh, trade union economic uh, trade union we are also with the uh, g20 
that's what you call the macro managers of the uh, the global economy we're also part of that g7 we are uh, very close to that and then india is seriously considered in g7 and all that so we are from the the core economic club of the world to the macro economic management of the world to the trade union uh, you know uh, protestations and uh, all of that that part of the narrative also we are very much there in addition to that if we look at the institutional involvement of india i think in great part of the i mean very rarely you know any country is individually involved in so many countries be it uh, brics uh, ipsa sarc uh, shanghai cooperation uh, uh, you know china driven uh, asia uh, infrastructure investment bank and all of that if you, if you look at it I, i think we are a major player in the institutional uh, you know paradigm of the of the times uh, today so we are greatly greatly visible so how are we conducting ourselves in this state of visibility how are we conducting itself that's what the my final argument that's the sixth phase of the contemporary phase is that we are uh, doing it in uh, rather uh, two broad ways one is that that we have by uh, now india has a great wealth of uh, soft power and uh, soft power means in you know, a statistically if you look at it 15 million mobile telephones get sold in india every month and now 15 million uh, uh, sri lanka's population is 20 million so we merely buy the similar number of uh, you know uh, uh, mobile telephones it's such a great uh, market for the whole uh, world everybody would like to be part of that uh, that uh, market uh, to have a, a share of it bollywood for that matter bollywood has done a wonderful job in battling india's values systems traditions songs and uh, many things and more interestingly if you look at it 2012 13 tata group tata group they emerged as the single largest private sector employers in the in in britain british uh, britishers they came to india colonized and remained here for 250 years as a colonial power now tatas have gone back to europe to the british uh, homeland and they are the largest employers to the british people which is facing a very miserable economic uh, in our times today indian restaurants for that matter if you look at it they are also a very large employers in uk and not only large employers if you put their shipping sector coal and steel sector and textile sector put together indian restaurants employ much more than all these critical sectors put together so uh, that's where uh, you know i see that uh, india has from the millennium one to till now it has continued to maintain a civilizational continuity dialogue in spite of the diversity challenges poverty and colonization all of that we have continued to continue to manage ourselves with the distinction with autonomy with the value system order and uh, you know the civilizational character continues to guide us uh, in our future uh, endeavors and uh, future engagements and all that so that's where when i come to the last portion of the title of the the, the webinar that has india lost our foreign policy i wouldn't uh, you know agree to say that uh, india has lost our foreign policy i would rather uh, you know you know feel uh, you know uh, comfortable say that uh, india's time has arrived the critical time where india will be a peace axis of the world negotiating between the the largest stakeholder of peace in the world today is india the americans wouldn't uh, like peace they would like to intervene they would like to dominate the chinese would like to have their sphere of influence india yes it has a sphere of influence but it is civilizational in, in character it is uh, soft in nature and in practice non uh, dominating as process strategy talked about and so i would uh, rather call uh, india as a peace peace axis for the future times and the amount of goodwill capital india has that's that's the biggest uh, strength india has our single largest limitation is that the, the size of our foreign policy establishment is one of the minimal uh, in the in the world order it's a large country widely it has emerged but the size of india's foreign policy we have hardly 123 uh, diplomatic establishments employing around 750 people compared to china's 20000 people they are negotiating china's national interest so we have to expand the size of our diplomatic uh, network so that i think the the the, the sub power of india the image relational value of india or the peace axis 
courageous enough to up, up India can far well be handled into or carried to the international community. And that's where I rest my argument. Um, uh, thank you very much. So I have my uh, second responsibility now. I uh, invite uh, now uh, we have uh, uh, three panelists, uh, Professor Sara Bilali, uh, Professor Department of History, Rajat Gandhi University, uh, Rono Hills, uh, Domuk, Ornachal Pradesh. Ma'am, you can uh, start your presentation. And uh, ideally 20 minutes because uh, a lot of discussion should be there. So uh, please start, ma'am. A very good evening to one and all. Yeah, very good evening to one and all. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be invited by uh, the Bidha Chandra College, though I'm not aware of exactly where it is, but I know it's in Hooghly. So great privilege to be invited here. But at the moment, when I see the number of speakers and the trajectory in which they are speaking, uh, my position seems to be a bit out of place because my basic discipline is history. So when I was told that I have to speak something on the foreign policy, so I said I'm going to take the history back to even maybe the 18th the 19th centuries. So the organizer said, okay, it's permissible. So in that kind of a context, I'm going to speak. Maybe many of the people know about it. And I'm, in a way, try to stretch the historical reality to the reality uh, currently that is being faced. And uh, since I come from the frontier state of Arunachal Pradesh, so I would probably be able to give a kind of a, a backdrop under which, because there are a lot of intersections that have happened in, in the creation of what is the colonial, uh, the legacy that we have in terms of the foreign policy issues that we are having. So in that kind of a context, uh, I, uh, I, my lecture would be uh, focused on. So I hope I'm able to do justice to that. And once again, thanks to my co-panelists, and I also welcome everybody into this thing. So at first, start with uh, what we know as, uh, you know, people talk about China. And when, when people talk about China and Arunachal Pradesh, I find it a bit difficult to digest. Uh, I still tell my students, it's not, you know, China per se there, but it is a historical reality that Tibet has been uh, reality. So I tell them that China, Tibet should always be the focus area in any historical discussion. Uh, so when we go back and to look at the backdrop and how this whole line of actual control or whatever line that we have over which we are fighting. So it has again two distinct trajectories and all of us must know the Ladakh uh, uh, sector being designated much, much earlier than what we know as the McMahon line, which is the eastern sector, and Ladakh sector comes with the uh, johnson Ardag line, uh, which is uh, much into the uh, 19th century, well, 20th period, when all these uh, vacillations take place in the policy, and that is how it comes into the, uh, it is foregrounded in that. So, basically, the policy of, uh, like, when I look at trajectory of Arunachal history per se and how the colonial uh, state looked at it uh, for a very very long time it looked at Arunachal Pradesh and its communities as buffers and buffers in the context of two important areas one was Burma till 1885 when Burma became a part of Greater India and the other was so in, the initial focus was on Burma and then it was on Tibet. So basically uh, the focus was directed on three main uh, axes. One was you know to uh, try and the, the, the kind of geographical idea that they had uh, was that they tried to look at the geographical space of Tibet as approachable to what is present day Arunachal Pradesh and to approach that area for trade links uh, for finding a closest route to China through it and uh, one of the main things was to look at Christianity also to go to, to China and to, through, a, through a kind of a backdoor kind of a thing that was the base, uh, basic policy and then the other interesting part was very very cartography the cartography was basically to 
try and settle the uh, the long, uh, which starts from Burard and the other geologists, that uh, about uh, settling between Sanko and the Brahmaputra. So that is what fascinated them and a lot of the issues regarding Tibet and our conservation in India took place them in the focus of that. So what we look at is uh, basically the great game and all of us, I think all foreign policy specialists would be aware of what the great game is about. So the great game is about the basic issues between Great Britain, Tibet, China and Russia. And if we look at how the policy with Tibet was uh, focused on, if we find that it was uh, very largely based on the specter they had regarding Russia and how China, uh, uh, Tibet was getting closer to it. And the kind of you know experiences they had right from the time of Warren Hastings when uh, Captain Bogle was sent into that area, so they were not very uh, keen to meet them. And later on, uh, during Warren Hastings' time, but they, uh, the, uh, the Tibetan, as elusive as ever, were not interested to entertain. She essentially, had come to convert them into Christianity, so they did not uh, try and uh, bring them into that form. So, 1886 again, we find uh, Tibetans uh, attack the Kingdom of Sikkim. And during that time, there's a British intervention as a result of which we, for the first time, find in the Himalayas the watershed policy used to demarcate a particular area, which was again followed by trade agreements in 1893. So, continuously through these negotiations that they were having, they were made to feel that whenever they went to the, uh, the Tibetan uh, space or the Tibetan political space, they were always met by the Chinese. And uh, continuously again, China uh, was trying to claim that right from the Yuan dynasty, which was a Mongol dynasty, uh, that is uh, 13th century, that Tibet had essentially been a part of China and so definitely they lay claims on that. And this was further strengthened by the belief that, you know, Tibet was very elusive and did not want to negotiate in one and one with the British. And then again, on the other hand, uh, because of the Chinese uh, dominance or hegemony, they were always trying to get another kind of a friend and Tibet was in that kind of a sense. It continued to uh, uh, be drawn towards Russia and we had a lot of visits by Dalai Lama into the Volga region on the excuse that it's a Buddhist region and we had Torchiev, one of the important uh, representatives of the Jar coming here. There were reports of uh, there were reports of arms coming into that particular area. So therefore we find that even though 18, 1893 there was the demarcation or the delineation of the uh, Sikkim uh, Tibet uh, borders, but yet uh, Tibet continued to defy uh, that kind of a thing and at the same time simultaneously there were rumors of Tibet and Russia uh, coming up into this, uh, coming up into an agreement. So it is in this context we have what what is uh, the famous Young Husband mission uh, which, was, which went to Lasha which tried to force the Dalai Lama and uh, the Dorji of the uh, Russian representative who was present there, uh, they had to, you know, go underground and uh, there was no resistance at all. And there also they found that the Chinese Amban was a resident, it uh, welcomed uh, Young Husband's mission into that kind of an area. So this also created a belief that actually China was the overlord in that kind of area. And this, uh, they did not attempt to uh, persuade Tibet from uh, refraining to maintain an independent status with Russia. So, because of that, the, uh, uh, while the Chinese Amban signed it, the Tibetan Assembly gave uh, a kind of a yes to the Anglo-Tibetan Convention that was there and the setting up of the two ports that was there. Uh, here, uh, it is also pertinent to mention that the contention that the Chinese are having continuously is about the region of Tawang. And Tawang had been a trading port since the early 19th century and is responsible for the interest in that area because it was recognized as a part of Tibet. However, the, by the discourses in the British texts were more concerned by the end of the 19th century to deal with Lhasa in the con context of the control of trade. So, continuously, uh, uh, the British were given the idea that the Chinese are overlooked. So, finally, by the fact that they, the specter of Russia was with them in the northwestern frontier, in the Afghan wars, so they never wanted somebody else to come and, you know, uh, upset the, uh, the status quo here in the northeastern frontier. 
So then we have the Peking Convention of 1906 and that practically seals the fate of Tibet because in 1906 the agreement which was signed which gave uh, uh, China the supreme position that was there, it sold off their rights without their consent because Tibet was viewed as a buffer between India, British India and Russia and it was thought uh, uh, that there was no need of a buffer between India and China. And immediately in the aftermath, Russia was going through a critical period in Europe through the Manchurian Wars. And the British thought it is the most appropriate moment to get them also to sign an agreement. And that kind of an agreement, which was known as the Anglo-Russian Convention, which was signed in 1907. And that uh, made uh, it compulsory that whoever is going to negotiate with the Tibetans has to do it only through the instrument of China. So this was, you know, the final seal in selling off the rights of Tibetan interest without their consent. And then that was a time they never even realized that China would be such a power they would have to contend with. And that is the reason why uh, uh, that was there. So immediately China practically got a license and we know how Lhasa, uh, the Dalai Lama previous to this Dalai Lama had to flee Tibet in 1910. Uh, Russia was taken over and the most interesting thing where there were reports in 1910 uh, in Calcutta that uh, Chinese troops had moved close to Sikkim and not only that had moved very close to a territory called Rima which is just across the Idumishmi territory in Arunachal Pradesh and simultaneously in 1911 uh, here uh, one must make mention of the fact that Arunachal Pradesh, current Arunachal Pradesh has not been uh, uh, a colonial uh, annexed territory. In fact, it was the only space uh, which was, uh, there was colonial intervention till 1911 and this intervention was in terms of military expedition and some trade agreements into that area, uh, some entry, entry into it through trade. And the other uh, uh, aspect of it was that they would, you know, uh, there were, they were, uh, they were these officials who would go into the interior areas with the abject, uh, like, uh, declaration that they are trying and negotiating with the uh, people to cultivate friendly relationship with the tribes. Because uh, on the other hand, they also did not want to, uh, they were not aware uh, how the Tibetan relationship would play out if they directly uh, came into, uh, they directly annexed this territory, which was economically not very viable, as as we know what the, the colonial state stood for. So, because of all these realities, uh, uh, they did not even expect, and they did not have any, you know, they, their mandate was just an annual tour, so the state was practically very, very itinerant. So, uh, it is in this context that we suddenly find that during one of the visits of one of the political officers in 1911, he was murdered. So on one hand, there was the crisis that, you know, Lhasa was occupied, the Dalai Lama fled, and uh, and the, the reports of, you know, the Chinese troops across the Arunachal border. At the same time, there is a rebellion happening, the political officer getting killed uh, in a place very close to the borders. So that, again, was construed as a threat to the empire and because of this internal uh, rebellion that took place, it was considered very, very essential because as regards to Arunachal, uh, we still have something called an inner line uh, permit which we needed, but it goes back to 1873 when we had the regulation known as Regulation 1 of 1873, which uh, created a jurisdiction uh, till which the British ordinary limits would be there and beyond that it would not be there. And they said that there is something called an outer line. They had no geographical idea. Uh, they only broadly knew that the space did exist and uh, that was it. So after 1911, they construed it as a threat to the empire and the other uh, very uh, strong suspect, uh, they started suspecting that it was the Chinese probably who had instigated because these people had Mongoloid troops and it was a Chinese instigation that uh, the Chinese were on the other side of the border and this issue must have happened in this particular state because of that. So in uh, that context, we see that uh, 
immediately after uh, military expedition taken up, taken up, uh, taken up against the Adi rebellion or the Upper rebellion as they call it, immediately uh, the British decided that there should be massive survey operations uh, right across the survey, which is the cartographic survey, and then there would be a delimitation of the border. So these two aspects took place simultaneously. So when these two aspects took place, and that is after that, we see the shining of the Shimla Agreement. Jo, though China consistently denies that the Shimla Agreement has uh, not been signed, uh, but uh, there, there are some records which are available in Delhi which talk about the agreement being there, but the fact that uh, the Chinese Amman had signed it, but it had not been approved by the uh, Chinese uh, em uh, emperor at that, uh, at that point in time. So it is in under these contexts that the uh, kind of uh, policy that had taken place. So again, if we look at what the McMahon line is, it followed broadly. So uh, here the British had no cartographic understanding of what the space exactly was. They had no previous cartographic understanding of that. So it was a very hurried kind of missions that were taken up. And uh, as a result of that, uh, uh, the military expedition also took out some of the uh, were also participated in some of the cartographic exercises and it is in the aftermath of this that we see some territorial changes take place like Walong uh, which was in Rima came into India then in the Subansiri region we have a uh, place uh, which is uh, the uh, Sari region a part of the Sari region which uh, it writes as T-S-A-R-I and this has been a part of Tibet where they uh, uh, they would uh, uh, basically uh, uh, there, there was a uh, the whole region was a ravine of a, it was known as a place of the holy crystal mountain and they, it would be it was a sacred space and there would be a 12 year a cycle of circumambulation of that holy space and uh, because of that uh, there were the groups who lived there they lived in a kind of a, a relationship with uh, these communities out uh, with, with the communities in present day Arunachal Pradesh. So one part of the ravine which was in Tibet earlier because of the watershed policy came into Suban City but again the watershed policy brought Tawang in. So it was the bringing of Tawang in which created most of the problems that started happening in the uh, forward policy uh, problems that we have. So. Uh, but it is interesting to note that uh, if you look at how Tawang was, uh, uh, again, let us try to understand. Uh, Britain is again, uh, sorry, uh, China is again currently trying to lay claims on entire Arunachal Pradesh on the ground that it had been Tibetan territory. No, it had never been Tibetan territory at all, except those, the Tawang region which had been incorporated into the watershed uh, 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 agreement, the, what, the watershed policy that they had right from the demarcation of Sikkim, the Himalayan crest being uh, used to decide uh, the, the foreign policy that was there. So in that kind of a case, that the, when Tawang Monastery comes in, and then uh, during the 19, uh, right from 1912 onwards, as I had mentioned previously, uh, there was this massive exercise of cartography and you know, uh, officials traveling uh, on the Tibetan Indian border, right in the eastern sector, which is present day Arunachal Pradesh, uh, which included one very prominent plant hunter. His name was Frank Kingdon Ward. And there were two officials known as uh, F.M. Bailey and Morshed, who apparently it, 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 it overshot their mandate and even asked to have traveled right across without permission. So uh, the, the book that he really writes is called No Passport to Tibet. So it is when these kinds of exercises are taking place uh, uh, to settle the Sangpo and uh, other things. So in passing, all these two uh, people, uh, three people who are uh, traversing across places between Tibet and Arunachal never ever mentioned except for a particular space which is known as Pemako which is currently uh, in 
A little part of it is in Arunachal Pradesh. It's in uh, uh, very north of Singha. It is a place where the Brahmaputra, where the Sankhu and the Brahmaputra meet. And uh, another place is Mechuka, which was held uh, since the 16th century through a royal kind of grant, a grant from the Plaza. Except these places, uh, there has been no uh, direct form of administration of these areas by the Tibetans. But what had been seen is uh, in the 19th uh, early 20th century, right from 1903-4 onwards, when uh, the, they were under a lot of pressure from China on the eastern side, uh, there have been instances uh, where they moved into this area, brought land in the Bishmi territory in the, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the valley of a particular river, and uh, that is how they came into these spaces. But under no circumstances did they govern them. Uh, there was, it was very interesting that the passes that they governed, uh, they knew the territory till which remained with them and the territory which remained south of it, which was uh, which was under the uh, uh, the groups broadly brushed as you know lower barbarians known as the Lobas. So the Lobas were known under the various names, Black Lopa, all kinds of names were there. And anybody south of the Tibetan territory were all uh, the, like for instance the Monba, Loba, all these are south and sometimes a kind of a pejorative is used with this. So in this kind of a context we see that when, when even these uh, colonial writers are writing, we never come across any space. Of course, uh, they did extend at certain points in time their tax regime over certain tribes with whom they had some connections. But other than that, there was no direct form of control that the Tibetans have, which is very clearly shown by these historians. So in this kind of a context, in the current uh, foreign policy that is there, the claims of China into this area seems to be a bit far-fetched. And I think Senders K is one organization in, in, in based in Calcutta by mostly the uh, think tank of the army. So they are trying to ask us to look at local laws and local stories and try and you know, talk about how and where we can contest the fact that, uh, of, uh, that the fact that Tibetans were in on ownership of this land, and uh, you know, China is now trying to own this land. So it, it is in this context that I would, and it is interesting to note here. Like I just read a little bit of it. Okay, uh, last part. I'm sorry if I've exceeded the time. Uh, uh, what is interesting to note is Tawang. Uh, the tenuous control which the British exercise in the context of bringing Tawang under control can be argued in the light of the arguments of Lars Eric Nyman. According to him, the visit of Captain Neville to Tawang a few weeks after the establishment of the MacMahon line had very insignificant impact. In Tawang, he was not allowed to talk politics or to inform the Tibetan local authorities of the new... Okay. The British, British reluctance to occupy effectively the Tawang region with civilian and military means strengthened Tibetans in their belief in a quid pro quo deal with the Indian government. area and collects 
revenue from far south as the Ramzan. The India office agreed with this policy of refraining from sending annual parties because such acts would augment the responsibility and the pressure on the Assam government to establish a permanent administration in Tawang. Therefore, the intentions of the Assam government for the expulsion of the Tawang Zongs from the British side of the Macron line were ignored and it mattered little for the Indian office that after the departure of the political officer, the last expedition will produce no effect. So it is only after independence that Tawang became an integral part of India through effective control over it was achieved. So I hope I'm making sense in a, a kind of a discussion on international relationships where I was finding myself a bit awkward. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. It was a wonderful uh, account of the entire uh, you know, stretch of history where you presented Arunachal Pradesh in the context of uh, the British, the Chinese, the Russians and between as a buffer between Burma and uh, Tibet. Uh, I think uh, too many questions you will uh, receive, I'm sure. Uh, we will take the questions afterwards and we have the yeah, next uh, presentation by Professor uh, Delward uh, Hussain. And uh, Professor Hussain is, um, is uh, from the Department of International Relations, University of uh, Dhaka. Bangladesh, and uh, now it's my pleasure to invite uh, Professor uh, uh, Dilwar to uh, present his uh, ideas. Professor Dilwar, uh, Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer uh, for uh, arranging this uh, this webinar uh, on a very important topic, particularly as a student of intersolutions, I always uh, feel uh, it is a privilege to be part of any discussion on foreign policy. And when it is foreign policy of India, of course, it is it is uh, it is a very much uh, matter of honor. And so I I, I, I I thank the organizer, and also I, I thank the organizers for inviting me to this uh, session. And that I uh, actually I believe. Uh, uh, is an opportunity for me to learn more uh, than to speak or, uh, I mean, on, on the topic because the topic that uh, that uh, we all know I mean it is it is uh, very much part of its relations and the history and at the same time um, uh, it is an opportunity for me to, to learn uh, about Indian foreign policy from the experts and academics from India uh, so uh, this is this is uh, really a, a, a privilege for me and um, well, as I, I have heard from uh, uh, the previous speakers and particularly from the keynote speaker, uh, very distinguished Professor uh, Shibashish, uh, uh, so wonderful uh, keynote speech and then uh, followed by two uh, very, very uh, productive interventions by two scholars, uh, two academics on, uh, on the history of Indian foreign policy, uh, which is very enlightening for me. And uh, well, I mean, as I... I understand, uh, of course, I mean, that the keynote speech has very excellently, uh, I mean, excellently, uh, uh, I mean, abstracted uh, the, the, the idea of Indian foreign policy. Uh, although the title has has, uh, has been a little bit provocative in the sense that uh, the second part of the title or the subtitle that has been uh, uh, foreign policy or has lost its foreign policy. So it's, it's very provocative, very interesting. I mean, uh, and uh, uh, Professor Rudro has uh, dealt with this uh, this particular uh, point. Uh, he argued that uh, yes, India has uh, its foreign policy, and I also think I mean, well, I mean, every country has foreign policy uh, from uh, from one perspective and from other perspective. Uh, of course, one can uh, one can argue that uh, no country has foreign policy in this world because the world is uh, is 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 more uh, sort of uh, post-nationalist or uh, post-Westphalian kind of transition. Or some may not even agree with the idea uh, of the state, uh, the way we have organized the state uh, based on the typical uh, elements of a state and, and the, the overwhelming dependence on nationalism and, uh, and some other highly boundary-centric, border-centric, sovereignty-centric uh, notions uh, that, that we, we have seen in the history of uh, uh, modern interest relations, uh, uh, different countries, particularly major powers or, or great powers, have uh, uh, actually upheld in their foreign policies. Uh, well, so in that sense, 
in that sense, um, of course, there's a difference between foreign relations and, and foreign policy, and every country has foreign relations. And, and also, uh, also in, they have foreign policy, but it may not be that much strong for many countries, uh, because foreign policy actually demands a, a very sophisticated level of abstraction of ideas, uh, philosophy or principles uh, that, uh, that a country need, needs to actually uh, um, uh, base uh, in, 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 uh, 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 actions uh, for the outside world. Um, well, I mean, as, as a student of um, uh, foreign policy and also as I observe um, in foreign policy in India, of course, Indian foreign policy has a long history. And uh, Professor Rutra has clearly mentioned that, well, I mean, there are six phases. And if we consider Westphalian India, of course, the foreign policy of India started in 1947. Before 1947, it was not Westphalian India. It was a different uh, India. It's a civilization, and we are part of the India. And and uh, India was uh, was was a uh, sort of uh, uh, culture. India was sort of community, civilization, and political unit that we all know. I mean, I don't need to actually uh, 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 deal with this this matter. So, but but uh, since 1947, uh, India's foreign policy has been extremely important uh, for the entire uh, world. And know how the world actually uh, uh, progressed, um, although we, we, we saw, I mean, uh, because of the Cold War, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the world became bipolar, the world became turbulent, the world became uh, binary uh, in terms of uh, ideologies. Uh, but still India uh, uh, took the leadership uh, in creating some space, some diplomatic space to maintain some, some uh, actions uh, by the uh, post-colonial countries uh, about about their foreign policy. Uh, so, having said this, uh, as I see, I mean, if we think about the uh, uh, the uh, decision makers or the conduct of Indian foreign policy, uh, we can we can see. I mean, this is uh, I mean, widely highlighted by many uh, experts uh, uh, on Indian foreign policy that uh, and also uh, the, the previous speakers and particularly uh, our the speaker mentioned that uh, Indian foreign policy has been um, the legacy of uh, uh, of uh, Nehruvian tradition, or, and, and, and when the Jawaharlal Nehru uh, played a, a phenomenal role uh, in uh, in formulating India's foreign policy, the basis of Indian foreign policy, and even today, many want to uh, stick to this uh, tradition. So this very strong Nehruvian tradition is very important to understand Indian foreign policy and uh, Nehruvian tradition as we, as we understand, I mean, it, it, it is uh, based on a sort of uh, liberal internationalism uh, through which actually India then uh, tried to uh, pursue the policy of non-alignment and, and, and wanted to uh, stand by, by the subjugated, by the, uh, uh, by the people who, who actually who were suffering uh, because of the Cold War and because of the global uh, 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 threats uh, during that time. And, and Bangladesh case is, is, is an example, and as, uh, as Professor Rudra mentioned uh, in, in his speech, uh, and uh, of course we are, we are, we are very, in, very much indebted to India uh, for its uh, very enlightened role uh, during our liberation war. And, uh, and of course, I mean, no foreign policy I, I, I consider, I mean, no foreign policy is, is immune from realism. So, Indian foreign policy has also a realist tradition and, uh, and also some argue that it's a revivalist tradition. And, uh, and, and, and also uh, other uh, schools of thought are also relevant uh, to understand Indian foreign policy. Uh, and we can go with constructivism, we can go with liberalism or new liberalism and other neighboring regions. And uh, uh, because of 9-11 reality, post-9-11 reality, terrorism became an important issue. So India also became a, 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 a critical uh, um, a player uh, to counter terrorism, to combat terrorism, uh, and also promoting democracy, preventing nuclear proliferation. Uh, of course, India has has tested its own nuclear uh, uh, weapons uh, in 1998, but uh, but still, uh, I mean, uh, since uh, the, uh, some um, nuclear powers are there, so India has joined the club. That's that's uh, that's, that's the different issue, but. Uh, at the same time, India has been working to prevent the spread of nuclear proliferation. It is an, uh, India has a very important role in doing 
this world. And also, to India has has a very important role in uh, in 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 uh, dealing with uh, with uh, different uh, hostile uh, powers uh, who can destabilize or uh, can create uh, threats or challenges uh, at regional or global level. So the, the critical role of India is very important, and and also uh, India has its own uh, identity, own uh, aspiration. Uh, uh, of course, I mean many argue that India uh, is and India wants to be a superpower, uh, as a global power, and uh, some talk about the research in India. Uh, so India is also trying to find out its own uh, own place in the world, and uh, and I, I really like the idea of uh, Professor Shashivash that the, the the quest for um, recognition or the, even the politics of recognition is also very important to understand uh, the, the current uh, states or current state of Indian foreign policy. And uh, and uh, uh, of course, I mean, when we talk about uh, uh, India's uh, present uh, uh, foreign policy, uh, uh, I, I, I can also mention uh, some of the uh, issues uh, that has also uh, been uh, identified by some Indian scholars and uh, I, I think these, these are the important uh, issues or drivers of India's foreign policy like uh, what has been already mentioned, uh, the strategic autonomy or uh, India's status transformation, uh, 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 access to technology, energy security, regional consolidation, Asian uh, uh, sort of balances and also India has a strong uh, commitment to its uh, huge uh, uh, diaspora community is also very much uh, part of India's uh, foreign policy. But uh, uh, I, I, I don't want to take much time. Uh, what I feel, I mean, in, in, in the present day world, uh, what I feel as, as, as a South Asian or as a neighbor of India, uh, or even just in foreign policy, in the, in the current world or in the present world, we are living in a very, very uh, difficult time, very difficult time, and we have so many uh, issues or so many challenges uh, uh, before us. I mean, broadly, uh, we we uh, consider the world which is very globalized, uh, integrated, interconnected, and this globalization has different uh, uh, different uh, positions. Uh, that's one thing. But the the, the, the thing is that uh, I mean, we cannot deny the fact that uh, the world is. Uh, very, very integrated, very, very interconnected, particularly from economic point of view or even cultural point of view. Uh, so this this globalization uh, is is a massive challenge in, in today's world, and and of course different countries are facing it in different ways, and it is also affecting different countries in different ways. Some are benefiting, some are facing challenges. At some point of time, globalization was considered westernization, and now the Western world, I mean, many in the Western world are becoming extremely anti-globalist globalization. So you, you can see how actually interest change the positions of, 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 uh, uh, of people or of the elite. Uh, and, and there is no doubt that uh, the world is becoming more and more a multipolar world. And multipolarity is, 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 uh, is good from one sense. Uh, on the other hand, it's, it's a challenge. And we know what happened in the pre-Second World War period in, the, in, in, in Europe. I mean, the multipolarity how it contributed to, to uh, uh, instability, to uh, rivalry, competition, and hostility, and that in fact uh, led the world to, to the disastrous uh, Second World War. And then we, we see a lot of changes, uh, a lot of things like Brexit. Uh, European Union actually became European Union uh, in the post-Cold War period. I mean, to the Treaty of Maastricht uh, in 1992, EU became so uh, so transnational, uh, and and in 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 uh, in, uh, in some way, I mean, we call it it's, it's like a, a supranational kind of uh, entity. It's a new entity, EU emerged, and and, and that brought a different uh, reality. But then, uh, then we see uh, the, the same EU uh, witnessed experience, uh, experienced Brexit. So we can see the two different trends, uh, totally different, and and, and uh, these are happening uh, in, in today's world. And we, we see today transatlantic relations are not in good shape. And we know what uh, Angela Merkel or, or uh, France president are saying about their very 
very strong traditional ally in the United States. So their dependence on the United States or dependence on NATO uh, are being questioned. I mean, whether the U.S. can actually guarantee their security today, particularly under Trump administration. So the, the, the rifts in transatlantic relations is also a, is a very important reality to understand foreign policy of any country, particularly like India as a major power or as a global power. And we know about the great premier crisis in Russia, uh, 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 which is connected with Russia. We know what, what is happening with the Palestinians or the Palestine crisis and the Middle East has become almost a, 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 a catmire and we know what happened to the, to, to the finest civilizations in the world like Syrians and Iraqi and what now they are, they are suffering I mean, I mean, in, in, in today's world and we know about Afghanistan what is happening and also we have the, 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 the brand strategies like Belt and Road Initiative by China and also we have been the Pacific strategy and both are being posted by uh, I mean, China is pushing uh, uh, BRI and India, USA, Japan and Australia are pushing IPS. So, I mean, country like Bangladesh or many countries, they are actually facing this, this sort of uh, rivalry or uh, competition of these ideas. But, but what is happening? I mean, the, the present world actually is being marked by these, uh, these uh, issues, challenges, and they are actually creating, uh, to me, more uh, sort of uh, uh, uncomfortable uh, uh, reality or situation for a uh, uh, larger part of the world and also I, I believe even even the people who want to think beyond the Westphalian uh, uh, notion of, uh, of uh, uh, interest or notion of uh, identity uh, and, and of course I mean as far as norms are concerned I mean uh, India is also uh, of course uh, it, it, it is uh, multilateralism is, is very strong in India's foreign policy but at the same time what we see when we think about IPS, it is more about uh, trilateralism or uh, more about uh, for, uh, I mean, quadrilateralism, and uh, also we know about bilateralism and unilateralism. Uh, these are all norms, but then we see that some norms have become very important in, in some contexts and some are not important in other contexts. So uh, it's, it's, it's a very complex uh, kind of scenario with what we see, and, and in this scenario, uh, uh, of course, I mean, in India's foreign policy, as far as South Asia is concerned, we can see India is following this neighborhood first policy, particularly under the current uh, political regime in India. And uh, and also, we know about the act is the policy of uh, India. And uh, also, India has developed very special uh, relations with the United States. So, I mean, we. Is, uh, these, these are, 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 are important, but to what, uh, uh, what I, I would like to uh, emphasize, I mean, as we are uh, facing uh, the, the present uh, reality in today's world uh, by multifarious issues and challenges in different parts of the world, and they have cumulative uh, impact on, on the conduct of foreign policy of any country, including Bangladesh. And now we have COVID-19, which has come as a measure uh, sort of uh, threat to humanity and that's why actually the organizer has put the title as new normal uh, because new normal is not just uh, new normal in the sense of our uh, our uh, our conduct to our health and other issues social issues uh, in the post covid reality it is also the uh, how different countries are going to actually mobilize their their resources in the post covid uh, 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 world because uh, covid has 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 created a huge tool on on economic uh, development of different countries and particularly those who are very very promising countries and we know i mean uh, covid has has caused uh, uh, the, the economic depression to the extent of 1930s or even 2008 9 uh, it, 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 even it is far worse than this so who are gaining out of this uh, is a economic crisis in the world. So uh, one can debate on the, whether it is China or USA or EU or India or some uh, middle powers like South South Korea or some other. So I mean these, these issues are there, uh, and uh, so uh, this uh, this should uh, uh, this should also uh, uh, I mean influence our our uh, thinking. Uh, but finally, what I would like to uh, just uh, uh, conclude by saying that. I, I consider India has a very, very critical role even today, particularly when we think about a democratic and just uh, global order. 
and and global order, uh, which has been a, a, a topic of discussion, uh, particularly since the end of the Cold War, um, it has been um, described in many different ways. End of history, clash of civilizations, uh, 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 multipolar world, democratic world order, whatever world order we want, we want something just, something better, something more civilized than earlier, something something more contributing to the people of the world. Uh, because the world is not just a world of 193 countries, it's the world of more than 7 billion people. So this is uh, very important and India, because of its long tradition of supporting the developing countries, supporting the uh, third world countries, supporting the south, supporting the global south now, I think uh, uh, India's foreign policy uh, should uh, continue to emphasize this particular role of India and, and we know, I mean, North-South uh, uh, dialogue is not very, very prominent now because of the northern countries' uh, uh, interest or, or appetite. But I, 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 we, we know there is some sort of some level of North-South uh, linkage, North-South uh, bargaining. So India can play a very important role, and South-South cooperation is very important. Finally, of course, I mean India's role to regional peace and stability in South Asia and beyond is extremely important, and and uh, and India's uh, foreign policy. Uh, and India's uh, aspirations to, to become uh, more uh, uh, visible uh, in, in, in the form of a superpower or any other form for you even to become the permanent member of the UN Security Council. All uh, are fine uh, with, with, uh, with India, but at the same time, how India is contributing to, 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 uh, to regional or global peace, global uh, security, and particularly when it matters to, to the interest of the uh, developing world or the global south. Uh, actually, here lies, uh, to me, I mean, India's uh, historical strength, and that strength, I, I think, uh, uh, should be uh, uh, upheld. And uh, and that's all. I I, I think we, we can have many many uh, sessions on India's one because it is so vast, and, and that's what I I, I, I understand uh, uh, as my 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 uh, my. Uh, Knowledge about uh, India's foreign policy. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, thank you, Professor Dilawar um, Hussain, and it was wonderful. Uh, very, very complex scenario you captured and uh, simplified them uh, for the for uh, the last man also to understand. And uh, of course, you created a great agenda basket full of challenges. You know that had to be sometimes addressed both at India, at Dhaka, at uh, Washington, and uh, Beijing, and everywhere. I think uh, we are in a complex time frame. We are in a transition phase. But I think uh, wonderfully you carried the whole uh, notions of uh, Gen X and uh, number of other issues that I think uh, you know in the course of uh, discussion. Uh, you know I think uh, you will invite a uh, number of uh, questions. So. Uh, and then uh, with this, we now move to uh, uh, to Professor Sujit uh, Datta. Uh, Professor Sujit Datta is um, is uh, Associate Professor, Department of International Relations, University of Chittagong, uh, Bangladesh, and uh, he will be presenting his ideas. Uh, uh, Professor Datta, are you there? Professor Datta, are you there? Yes. Uh, yeah, I can. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you yeah. can you can start yeah. your the... yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. Firstly, let me thank the organizers for inviting me here. And thanks, special thanks to the speaker. Actually, I can learn a lot of things on each of the conference for the speaker. And thanks to my co-panelists who are renowned for their academic skills. And uh, thanks to all of them. And I think uh, thanks to the board, uh, Professor Monsieur for his uh, continuous support and cooperation to address this conference. And I, I will give my lecture in two parts. Firstly, I will discuss Indian foreign policy and formation of Indian foreign policy. And then I will discuss Bangladesh, irrigation, and its challenges. In my comments, Indian foreign policy can be divided into four things. And the first one is and it started in 1947 and 1994. Here I consider the 
and change our life with the career of Dhaka, Shakti, Shudhanti and Rajivra. The main ideas of this is a security policy and practices, modernized military power, strategic partnership going to increase the data, and Bangladesh liberation war, and first nuclear test, and the normalization of Sino-Indian relations. The third stage is improvement relations with the U.S. and this start from after the Cold War in 1990 and after 2014. And this is the stage roughly started after the end of the Cold War and follow of the After the U.S. was a super power, it is a popular global order. And Indian economy, particularly the socialist model and the marketist approach has passed after that time. And the finally, I just want to conclude the Indian policy is the neighborhood first and act in policy. And they start from the 2014 still now. The post 2014 state of Indian policy is characterized by an idea of enlightened national intelligence. The main idea of this state are interlinked neighborhood and integrated South Asia, emphasized on Indian soft power multi alignment with the Great Powers. On the other hand, the S East policy, replaced from the Blue East policy of the Navy, is an instance of the type of cooperation. This policy vision is to pursue a nursery strategic and economic relationship in the South Asia and the East Asia. Thank you. 
of the religious militant groups like Uji and JP in Muslim folk in Bangladesh. After the homily, uh, the power under the leadership of the Prime Minister Shetakina in 2019, the country declared a policy of zero tolerance to terrorism and militants. However, this problem couldn't be eradicated completely, and several writers, bloggers, publishers, and NGO workers have been killed by this kind of religious radicalism, which is the most important security concern for the northeastern region of India. Trade and economic factors. Bangladesh and are close trade and economic relationship. Bangladesh being India's largest trading partner in South Asia. So, still there is a huge trade deficit. Trade deficit is along with outstanding challenge for Bangladesh in India to seek peace. From March to June, the trade India suspended all the trade activities with Bangladesh through land force, which is contributed to wider trade gap between the two neighboring countries. <laughs> Water sharing, what of that? And yes, India's platform in Bangladesh. Even though India played a vital role in the independence of Bangladesh, providing arms, sharing, and other such traditional relationships, began to soar with a few years. In the recent years, NRC, CA, Rainbow Day, water sharing, uh, anxiety, and tension for the uh, a huge number of populations have been historically in India and this number is increasing day by day. So, it's, the, it's now very important for Bangladesh to uh, India to share this kind of space. And Rohingya is more important for them. A good relation with uh, India or Bangladesh people want a proactive role but the reality is that regarding the Rohingya crisis and its resolution, there is no fruitful positive reaction or measure taken by India. Even though India took the opportunity to get closer with Myanmar for their new strategic interest, this issue stands with severe concern for future Bangladesh India relations. China factor in Bangladesh India relations. The ongoing China Indian conflict would Fuel the geopolitical dimension that is now Asian leading to new relations within this region. Virtually the village that rivalry between China and India makes the relationship with the neighbors vulnerable. Bangladesh emerged the new Bangladesh with the state in geopolitical location, population, use population, market, and manufacturing power would grasp the opportunity from the ongoing China Indian crisis. On the other hand, the ongoing COVID-19 crisis, China has stepped in with much-needed medical supplies to Bangladesh. Besides, since 97 percent of Bangladesh products got duty free access in uh, China in the last month, it is very important for uh, China Bangladesh relations. Very important for China India relations. Exactly, I'm very optimistic and Bangladesh India relations may be able to get over the situation sooner later. Because in the Bangladesh maximum of the people are dealing on that India is a big country and should attitude is a big brother but not like a big brother attitude. But in small cases India attitude like a big brother attitude. But government should take uh, into account public emotion because the formality mutual agreement and foreign policy as well as constructive assimilation of the mass people of the young inclusion, foreign policy can rather in developing a stronger friendship between these two countries to nations, which can be extremely profitable both for both states as well as for the greater South Asian nations. So as a Bangladeshi people, all the Bangladeshi people always want to do that the NRC will never get any disturb from the Bangladesh and in the case of Rohingya issue, India will support more and more and the water share especially in the Vista, India will give the water and the access water for Bangladesh 
parts in Indian Bangladesh government can do it, it will be better for the future Bangladesh India relations. And thank you very much for giving my the opportunity to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sujit uh, Dutta. I think uh, you captured uh, great many areas of uh, immediate concern, uh, you know, pertaining to trade, economy, water sharing, terrorism, China factor, and a uh, number of such issues. I think uh, many of the student participants and faculties, all of them would be interested to, to I think, ask a uh, number of questions. Now, I think, Dr. Uh, uh, you know, are we all the panel speakers. Dr. Samindra, are you there? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir, I am there. I am there. Yeah, 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 okay. So, uh, you know, we completed uh, a very uh, enlightening, very enriching uh, series. And uh, I think in the beginning itself, uh, Professor uh, Sivasis Chatterjee set the tone in a very normative uh, uh, way and uh, characterized uh, India's uh, uh, fund policy orientations. Now, as I understood it, so uh, maybe you know, there might be limitations in my understanding, but he largely captured it from the civilizational point of view, from the positive autonomy narrative, non-dominating and uh, multilateralism uh, now orientation, collective goods, and number of such uh, very, very, very normative level, he dealt with the whole idea of uh, fund policy. Uh, pertaining to India, and uh, I'm sure uh, a lot of questions will be there. And uh, then my presentation, I tried to capture uh, the phases in which uh, Indian foreign policy can perhaps be understood. But uh, I started with the what we call the Thucydides trap, is the state of conflict that uh, international order is uh, facing today, and the prospect of uh, multiplex world order or uh, uh, great convergence idea. But then I uh, carried it to the uh, to present in uh, different different phases of the uh, uh, phases of India's foreign policy. Now, followed by me, I think uh, Professor Hilal, Hilali was uh, very polite to say that uh, she is an historian and doesn't doesn't have the ability to speak on foreign policy. But I think you created a very fascinating uh, you now interlink between the foreign policy agenda and the historic facts and figures and the regions where you are sitting uh, currently. And uh, you know, I'm sure uh, you know people. Everybody must have enjoyed the whole uh, process. Professor Dilawar, uh, you know, from the other side of the border, you know, we have been uh, in territorial contiguity. We have been in political exchange of ideas, and uh, interactions have been have been uh, in fascinating order. And uh, uh, you know, you captured the whole complexity of world uh, in its transition. And with a lot of questions uh, you posed, I think none of us may have the right answers for that. So I think the interactions might open up some of the you know, clarifications on that. So Sujit uh, Dutta, you know, he captured uh, by and large the issues of trade, uh, economy, water sharing, terrorism issues, China factor in Indo Bangladesh relations and all that. And uh, now, now I think. Uh, now, we open the floor for uh, questions. Now we will do it this way that we were. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, I am Savindra Mohan. Please, uh, can I ask, uh, pose one question? Yeah, please, please. Uh, please now, open and whoever wants to ask, please uh, unmute your microphone and uh, ask and then mute it again. Okay, thank you, sir. My question is uh, to you, sir. And of course, if uh, Professor uh, uh, Shivashi Chatterjee, to both of you. There is a saying that charity begins at home. And India being one of the big brothers, uh, she is supposed to look after her younger brothers. That is uh, Bhutan, Sri, uh, then uh, Nepal, then the other whoever brothers, uh, Bangladesh, of course. But given the current situation, and uh, of course, uh, once upon a time, Sark existed. But uh, now, due to India's say, dominant position or say out of the colonial attitude as uh, Professor Shivashi Chatterjee said and uh, of course uh, said uh, to dominate the Indian foreign policy 
Inda is now, may we say, flexing her muscles to dominate over her brothers. So could you say that uh, this domination of big brotherly attitude is hampering the relationship, say, between China, say, between her younger brothers, say, between Bangladesh and other, and Sri Lanka, of course, and Bhutan, of course. Okay, sir, are you asking the question to me, sir? Okay, okay, you can answer. Yeah, I, I think uh, I would also invite uh, Professor Chatterjee also to respond, maybe. Sir, you can respond first, uh, if you wish to. Yeah, please. So you can unmute your microphone. Please unmute your microphone, sir. Uh, I, I, I would be very happy if you first, uh, you know, uh, went ahead. I make me join you. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Uh, in the interest of time, quickly, I'll just respond. I mean, uh, first of all, I do not uh, somehow uh, feel comfortable with the idea of Big Brother. Two brothers are there, and uh, Big One is Big One in size, maybe in age, maybe, or uh, in many, many dimensions and variables. But the but the younger brothers also equally stand uh, you know, equal uh, position there. Now normally you know, uh, India has not been a very expansionist uh, power in attitude, but uh, it is also a fact of history that uh, sometimes we have taken many things for granted. Now if we take a few things for granted, it uh, goes a long time to to, to you know create uh, rapprochement or bring back the order and all that. Sometimes you now one has to be benevolent, one has, one has to be magnanimous in many many ways, and that's where uh, we have been magnanimous in many ways also. But we have been. Of late, uh, if we look at it, we continue. We uh, are no more receiving any donations from the international, um, you know, any of the countries. But we have emerged as a new donor also be it uh, Bhutan, up to Afghanistan, Bangladesh, uh, Nepal, you know, uh, everywhere we are trying to reach out to them in many, many ways. And, uh, but, but the whole framework of uh, certain amount of disagreement is largely, it is in the context of the larger framework of, uh, you, know, you know, international order resetting itself or readjusting the agendas and all that. It's in the transitional mode I think everybody, every uh, now big power is trying to woo the others, and the you know if you if you look at it, you know while China has invested heavily on the sea ports and uh, be it in uh, in um, uh, you know Sri Lanka, be it in Gwadar port and all that, you know matchingly uh, the Americans are also electrifying the villages in Solomon Island and Fiji and uh, all of that. The Australians are sending their engineers and the Japanese are funding it and the Americans call it that, uh, as a blue dot net uh, framework. So what is happening is that in the whole framework, the idea of center periphery that used to dominate in the 60s and 70s, that part is, is uh, now no more there. There is nothing called uh, center and periphery. The Americans know in need Fiji, Indians need Maldives, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and the Chinese are also trying to woo each other and all that. So it is in the whole uh, game of transition, I think uh, we are going through some amount of uh, teething challenges, pulls and pressures and all that. But after some time, I think the water will settle down and there's a clearer uh, orientation will, will emerge. So some of the understandings and misunderstandings may have to be recrafted and rescripted so that there's a mutual uh, you know respect and uh, you know understanding of uh, each other that that's what is my response so uh, you would like to yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I i think by and large uh, the ground has been very well covered uh, i have a slightly uh, way to i mean sort of uh, get at that which is the two my understanding is that our problems in our neighborhood when it comes to South Asia, in fact, is a much deeper structural problem. Okay, I mean, so it's mired in our past. It's more of a sociological issue and a sociological sociological problem, okay, I mean, rather than, you know, a typical what you call a foreign policy problem. You know, I mean, sort of it's become a foreign policy problem in the Westphalian sense. So okay, then you have to problematize, you know, Westphalia. Uh, as much as a student of history, as a student of sociology, uh, in order to, in a way, let's sort of, you know, uh, understand where exactly the challenges that come from. Okay, to not go into 
twenty sixteen is enough to the fact that we want to revive. I think the main point here is the fact that you you know, I mean, uh, on the one hand, this opportunity in fact has been crafted on the anvil of age reality. But the principle of age reality in fact doesn't really do justice to the needs, uh, cultural and the social and and, and, the, and the sociological mosaic. You know, uh, which in fact you know goes back in time and has always presented this you know this space as a kind of a meta state or a meta associated space. Okay, and so now you have to realize you know the nation states, but these state reality in fact doesn't take care of the fact that you know I mean our political borders and our social and cultural borders in fact would never be inside. Okay, and so when you have made these nation states. You know, into full-fledged nation states. As a result, you know, we are always, you know, into this complex, complicated business of our domestic politics getting into our foreign relations all the time. And when that happens, where your, you know, uh, unfinished uh, domestic politics, you know, in a way that sort of gets into the way of foreign policy. Now, as a result of that. You know, uh, crafting credible, independent, autonomous, well-directed foreign policy at your neighbors in fact would always be a challenge. So it's not a question of uh, charity. It's not a question of uh, you know power differentials. It's not a question of uh, you know being pragmatic and realistic all the time. Yes, these are there, but the main point in fact is that no matter how much you try, how much you try. There will always be, you know, I mean, these problems of uh, what is called, the, uh, you know, the, the unsettled space. Okay, you know, I mean, uh, something which is in the interstices all the time. And given the fact that what is there in the interstices, in fact, is very difficult to delineate into very clearly definable and separate registers of the domestic on one hand and the external on the other. So the inside always, in a way, lets us sort of become the outside of the other. And it plays the other way around. As a result, it becomes very difficult to create a South Asia policy, which in fact would be uh, comfortable to all at uh, a long period, you know, over a long period of time. So, in a large sense, the disadvantage that India, in fact, will always have vis-à-vis -vis a power like China is the fact that, look, you know, with South Asia, our relations, in fact, are not specifically. Which are distant states. Okay, I mean, so it's essentially questions of uh, how you relate to your own divided people. So, on the one hand, you have to grant the fact that we are all independent nation states and we can't go back to the meta state identity that we used to have. But on the other, that societal identity, in fact, is the fact of life. You can't, you know, as, as uh, makers of, of, of state policy, you can't. Can't negate that. You can't avoid it. Okay. I mean, so it's not a question of whether we are magnanimous, whether we are more, more parochial, whether we are tugged more by uh, predilection to power, or gravitate more by the more you know. I would say, you know, more, more nebulous, uh, normative concerns. The, the, the real fact is that we are caught in this no man's land between the inner on the one hand and uh, the inside rather on the one hand and the outside on the other. And there is no other space than South Asia where the challenge in fact is almost existing. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Hussain, would you like to intervene quickly? Uh, well, I mean, uh, this, this issue has been uh, dear for long. I mean, uh, uh, as you know, I mean, uh, this, uh, this idea of uh, uh, Big Brother or all these things are there. But uh, I, I, I agree with uh, Professor Shivashish. I mean, this, the, the problem lies elsewhere. I mean, it's, uh, I, even if I go with the statements by the po politicians in India, I mean, uh, uh, the late uh, foreign, uh, foreign Minister of India uh, or external uh, affairs minister, Sushma Shoraz, she was uh, 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 telling uh, in the Indian parliament, uh, and also in Nepal, that what uh, what uh, our government 
meant uh, actually the India's policy towards its neighbors. It is not big brother, it is rather elder brother. So, so you see, uh, even the politicians acknowledge the, the fact that there is something wrong with the idea of big brother or idea of dominance or all these things. So, so they, 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 they actually dealt with this issue by calling the elder brother. So actually, to me, actually, it is not the issue of brother or, or elder or even, uh, uh, I mean, we, we are, as you have also emphasized, I mean, it's, it's the relations between or among the uh, independent actors and we go by uh, whether it is bilateral relations or multilateral forum, whatever it is. I, I mean, I, I really like the idea that uh, Professor Shivashish mentioned in the in the beginning that progressive, enlightened national interests. If India shows this kind of national interest to Bangladesh, or Bangladesh shows the same to India, and and then we could see a very different ballgame. So. We, we need to actually understand the philosophy, understand the perspective, uh, or understand the, 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 the very basis of interactions. This is very important. We, we, uh, we do not need to uh, uh, actually discuss the details. We know all these things, and we can talk about the figures and facts and everything. But the point is that this, this, the, the attitude or the perspective is, is very important. So I, I think uh, things have changed a lot. I mean, over the over the years, but still we have to go a long, uh, long way uh, to to have uh, such kind of um, very, very um, uh, mutually, uh, uh, I mean, uh, respectful, beneficial relations. But but this is also at the same time the reality of of West Berlin states. I mean, oh, although we 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 consider that uh, uh, we don't want to be confined to this case of Westphalian uh, kind of um, uh, uh, norms or ideas. We want to go beyond that, but at the same we have to deal with this also. So we need a lot of imagination, a lot of a lot of progressive ideas, and that should actually guide whether Bangladesh, India or achha, achha, achha. leaders to a better future or better interactions uh, for mutual uh, benefit. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Professor. Ah, uh, uh, next uh, 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 Yeah, would you like to, uh, Dr. Dutta, you would like to respond? Apni bolin, apni bolin, apni sir, kya tu bolen jin? Yes, chatte ji. Ba onu kichu ba WhatsApp pe. Yes, Dr. Pradhan ke bolen. Yeah, actually, indeed, undoubtedly, South Asia region is very vulnerable. In the case of geography, economy, military, large scale. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, we are going to 
lot of time we are, we are really sorry for that and definitely we will uh, try to uh, arrange this kind of program in the future and we will have you over here and that time we can uh, I will, will try to uh, I will try to provide more time uh, so I will uh, uh, so I will kindly request uh, Dr. Mitali Sinde uh, she is the assistant professor of history uh, of Bijan Chandra College Vishra to deliver the vote of thanks uh, Mitali madam are you there? Dr. Mitali uh, Sinde are you there? hello Okay, they've told me you carry on, you carry on, you, you carry on. Okay, so um, I think she's having some uh, network issues. Uh, so I'm only delivering uh, on behalf of her the vote of thanks. Uh, so first of all, uh, I would like to thank all the distinguished speakers for their time. Uh, I will uh, begin with uh, Shibashi uh, sir. Uh, uh, thank you so much sir for your time once again. I would like to thank uh, R.G. Pradhan sir for his time. Uh, Dr. Dilwar Hussain uh, sir, Dr. Sudhir Jotso, uh, Madam, uh, uh, we will also like to thank uh, Madam uh, for her uh, yeah, Madam, uh, time, uh, uh, Madam uh, Shara Hilali and uh, to all the participants uh, for the, 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 the last two and half hours. Uh, yeah, so, uh, I would like to thank the, the, the two uh, the, 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 the department uh, for the uh, department. কার্টেন Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, bye.